Hey everyone, before we get into this video, I just want to acknowledge all the support that I received on my latest video, and I'm incredibly grateful for it. I definitely didn't expect it, and I'm very appreciative. My upload speed is a little slow, so thank you for being so patient. I'm trying out a lot of different video ideas right now because I'm trying to discover what I really enjoy making as well as what you guys will enjoy watching, so thanks for the feedback. I want to start off the video by mentioning that through the course of this video, we will be taking a deep dive into the character of Dutch Vanderlyn, primarily his appearance throughout Red Dead Redemption 2. We're going to be delving into heavy spoilers, so if you haven't played the game, just don't watch. With all that in mind, let's begin. We can't always fight nature, John. We can't fight change. We can't fight gravity. We can't fight nothing my whole life all i ever did was fight but i can't give up neither i can't fight my own nature that's a paradox john red dead redemption 2 is a fascinating game not only because of arthur morgan and the story he goes through but because it's also a story that is unconventional in the way it's told arthur morgan the protagonist of the game he's a killer and a criminal whose redeeming qualities at the start of the game are his fierce loyalty to his gang, which he considers to be his family, and the acceptance of his deeds as unlawful and morally wrong. See, despite Arthur's actions, he still possesses a moral compass. He kills people, but not because he enjoys it or because he feels like it's justified. He commits acts of wrong for the sake of his family. Regardless of whether Arthur is a hero or an anti-hero, that's a potential video for another discussion, there are many decisions Arthur makes that the player does not have control over. Arthur will always collect debts when Strauss asks him to. Arthur will always rescue Micah when Dutch tells him to. Arthur will always end up in Guarma. Arthur will always get sick. Arthur will always help Reigns fall. Arthur will always rescue John from prison and ultimately fight Micah. Arthur moves the story forward in ways that neither Dutch or Micah could. With all that said, I think it makes sense to call Arthur the protagonist of this story. An antagonist is a character in a story who is presented as the chief foe of the protagonist. I think many people would agree that Micah is the chief antagonist of the story. But why him more than Dutch? What has Micah done differently than Dutch to earn him the title of antagonist? I think it boils down to this. The definition of antagonist is a person who actively opposes or is hostile to someone or something, an adversary. So who opposes Arthur most, Dutch or Micah? In order to know this, we have to view the goals of each character. Arthur's goal at the beginning of the game falls directly in line with Dutch. And Dutch's goal is simple to begin with. Get enough money to head west. Now we are stuck east of the Grizzlies and out of money and a long way from a dream of virgin land in the west. This changes as the story goes on, but this is essentially Dutch's original goal at the beginning. Micah, however, has a different goal. Return back to Blackwater and retrieve the money they hid. I think this difference in goals is what begins the conflict between Arthur and Micah from the very beginning. I'll go back to Blackwater and get the money. Meet you all someplace and we'll be home free, that's it. Arthur views Micah as a selfish man who doesn't care about anything or anyone but himself. This opinion of Micah is further reinforced when Arthur is tangled into a position to help Micah kill innocent people just so Micah can retrieve his guns. Here's open. Arthur, what? The fool brought this on himself. Arthur views Micah's actions of needless aggression to be irresponsible and self-serving. Micah views Arthur as an idiot and undeserving of such a high position in the camp. Micah feels as though Arthur's high status within the gang is unearned. He can't understand why someone as stupid as Arthur should be giving commands to anyone. This is why Micah continually reminds Arthur that he isn't any better than the rest of the members in the gang. Their feelings of one another can be seen on full display when the two of them argue just after Sean's death. He was a good kid. Well, how the hell was I to know? Let me see. They set us up once before. They didn't like us. 
We destroyed their farm. Should I go on? Go easy on him, Morgan. He was out trying to find a lead. Same as you, same as Hosea. All you do is complain when things don't work out. Except when it's your goddamn fault. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't give a damn about nobody but yourself. Oh, you act so high and mighty, but you're no better than the rest of us. I've ridden with you boys close on what? Six months now? And all you ever done was complain. You can fight, but you can't think. You can't do either. <laughs> okay, cowboy. I think it would also be good for us to watch their first scene with one another early in the game. You sure about this, Mike? Mr. Morgan, I never thought I would be so pleased to see your face. Been kind of lonely out here. Where's everyone else? Old mining camp back up the hill, huddled around a fire waiting for daddy to put food on the table. Said it before, we got too many mouths to feed. Well, we got a few less now, so you should be happy. That ain't fair, Arthur. I earn my share. You think it's unreasonable to expect others to do the same? Micah suggests that it's unfair and impractical for so many people in the game to sit around and wait for everything to be done for them. From Micah's perspective, he can't understand why some members of the camp do the hard work while others do nothing. He feels that people who do not serve a purpose do not deserve a share. We can see a similar conversation break out between Arthur and Micah later in the game. We're gonna need to cut some loose. From what Dutch says, the coffers are looking pretty good again. You could almost leave now if we chopped half the dead wood. We ain't doing that. I mean, why the hell do we need a gaggle of girls who won't even you if you put a gun to their head? I'm sure you've tried. Is it too much to ask, considering they get a piece of every damn dollar I bring in? Everyone does their share. I don't see you lifting a finger around camp. Uh, Swanson does his share. Molly, come on. No, uh, that's different. See, this is what I mean. If we go back to their first conversation, Arthur disagrees with Micah and views everyone in the gang as necessary to some degree. Even if someone in the gang served no purpose at all, Arthur would never allow himself to break his loyalty to the family he's acquired over the years. This is the crux of it all. Micah views Arthur as a fool for allowing his loyalty to blind him to the truth that the gang would be better off without useless people tagging along. This frustration with Arthur only continues as the game goes on because Micah believes he would be a far superior leader than Arthur. Arthur views Micah's lack of loyalty as untrustworthy, which leads Arthur to think of Micah as more of a liability than an asset. What makes Arthur and Micah's differing views of loyalty so interesting is that neither of them are fully right or fully wrong when it comes to their outlook on loyalty. And each man represents loyalty to the extremes. Arthur's excess of loyalty leads him to not question Dutch and follow orders blindly, regardless of whether or not he agrees with the morality of it. Micah's loyalty only extends so far as he feels he is benefiting in some way. Anyone who does not serve a purpose to him is considered to be useless. So where does Dutch fit into all this? If Dutch isn't the protagonist or the antagonist, then what is he? To find this out, I needed some help from Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell was an American professor of literature at Sarah Lawrence College who worked in comparative mythology and comparative religion. His work covers many aspects of the human experience. If we were to go off Joseph Campbell's terms regarding archetypal characters, we would probably describe Dutch as a shapeshifter character archetype. The shapeshifter is the character that changes. For example, the character might start off helping the main character or the hero only to betray the hero. The shapeshifter might be thought as an enemy at first only to be revealed to be an ally or vice versa. But I think Dutch is a little bit more complex than that. For Dutch, his criminal activity is not just a way to provide for his people. 
He seeks to make a difference in the world entirely. He views many of his crimes as acts of justice, a way to right wrongs. He sees himself as a dreamer in an ever duller world. Bus in and up down here. My daddy died in a field in Pennsylvania fighting this lot. I ever tell you that? We have lofty goals, Arthur. We're trying to reform society to a kinder, truer, better way. Now, of course, there's going to be casualties. We are dreamers in an ever duller world of facts. Now, I'll give you that. He is more than willing to fight for a cause that he deems is worthy and admires men from history and fiction who have done the same. To understand the psychology behind Dutch, I also did some reading from the works of Carl Jung. Carl Jung is a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalysist who founded analytical psychology. Jung's work has been influential in the fields of psychiatry, anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, and religious studies. Man has a certain pattern that is, makes him specifically human, and no, no man is born without this. We are only deeply unconscious of these facts because we live all by our, our senses and outside of ourselves. If, if a man could look into it himself, in Jungian terms, I think Dutch represents the ruler archetype. The ruler is a classic leader. They believe they should be the one to bring order to any situation. The ruler is stable, strives for excellence, and wants everyone to follow their lead. They tend to have plenty of reasons why everyone should listen to them. This is one of the 12 Jungian archetypes related to power. The ruler, in their desire to impose their will on others, can easily become a tyrant. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every ruler does become a tyrant. A ruler is in danger of becoming a tyrant, but that doesn't mean that they are guaranteed to become one. Dutch isn't a tyrant when we first meet him. When we're introduced to him as a character, he presents himself as a desperate man seeking shelter for himself and for his gang. He wants to regain control of the situation and find a place for everyone to lie low until the law stops searching for them. As the game progresses, we watch Dutch comfort Mrs. Adler as he insists that she come with them so she doesn't freeze to death. Later, we learn from a conversation between Javier and Arthur that Dutch shot a girl. Dutch killed a girl in a bad way, but it was a bad situation. I ain't like him, though. Arthur is surprised to hear this and is reluctant to believe it. This same event is referenced in Red Dead Redemption by the strange man. Do you remember Hattie McCourt's face? Who? She was a girl Dutch Vanderlyn shot in the head on that raid on the ferry a few years back. All these conversations and events begin to paint the initial portrait of who Dutch is. He's a man who cares greatly for his family and they trust him with their lives. He doesn't merely lead through words. He leads through actions as well. He would rather ride with Arthur through the snow than sit back and keep warm. He is quick to comfort helpless people in need, and yet this is the same man who will shoot a girl in the head when cornered. But based off Arthur's reaction, it could be that this murder that Dutch committed in cold blood was one of the first. As the game continues, Dutch and Arthur have a conversation which reveals a lot about who Dutch is. Come on. Are you sure about this, Dutch? Yes. Both been through a lot recently. We hardly back on our feet yet. And the last thing we need is to get bushwhacked by Como Driscoll. Let's go. I know you hate him, Dutch. He's here for us. I doubt that. Nope, you're just doubting me. I would never doubt you, Dutch. You... You always said revenge is a luxury we can't afford. This is the right call, Arthur. Take this. And this is about more than revenge for business long ago. They were talking about trains and detonators here. Cole always had good information. Come on. Because of the long history between the Vanderlyn gang and the O'Driscoll gang, 
Arthur assumes that Dutch is eager to attack the O'Driscolls out of revenge, and Arthur, being the blunt person that he is, confronts Dutch on this. Dutch responds to Arthur's confrontation by insisting that Colm, the leader of the O'Driscoll gang, is searching for them. When I was first listening to this conversation between Dutch and Arthur, I wasn't sure which one of them was correct. Arthur thinks that it would be better to stay back and heal while Dutch wants to take advantage of the situation and attack Colm's men. There's no way to know which one of them is correct this early in the game. However, watching this scene again, I think it's fair to assume that Dutch was paranoid more than anything. Dutch insists that Colm and his men are only up in the mountains because they're searching for Dutch. Arthur disagrees, and I think Arthur is right to disagree. When Arthur disagrees with Dutch, Dutch replies by saying that Arthur is doubting him. When Dutch says this, it's as if he's saying, you aren't loyal to me. Arthur, being the loyal man he is, insists that he is loyal to Dutch by reassuring his leader that he would never doubt him. So why do I bring this up? What makes this conversation between Arthur and Dutch so important? Well, I think it all comes back to Dutch's archetype. Dutch is a ruler, and one of the many personality traits of a ruler is that the ruler archetype seeks to stop chaos and disorganization by taking control. This is exactly why Dutch is always talking about a plan, and why it's become such a popular phrase associated with the character. The plan. I got a plan. Exactly as I plan. I ain't got a final plan yet. To a ruler, a plan introduces structure, which allows things to process in an orderly fashion. Chaos is unpredictable, and order is predictable. This is exactly why Dutch appears to be so shaken up when we first meet him in the game. He planned to rob the Blackwater Bank, and when the plan wasn't executed correctly, he was propelled into a state of chaos and uncertainty. He began to doubt himself, as most ruler archetypes do. And if the Blackwater bank job was his first major failure, it would make sense for him to begin to question himself and question the loyalty of the people who serve under his rule. People with the ruler archetype have a deep fear of being overthrown or put out of power. Because of that, they often suffer from paranoia. If it is not managed, it can affect their decisions. If the Blackwater bank job was Dutch's first major failure, then it would make sense for someone with his archetype to begin to think that maybe the people he rules over might abandon him. It's the fear that leads him to shoot a girl in the head, and it's that same fear that leads him to question the loyalty of everyone around him. I just don't know why we're doing any of this. Why? Why? Because I say so! I am done explaining myself to you! Dutch does not want to lose his gang. He doesn't want to lose the respect that people have for him. He doesn't want to lose the structure in his life. He wants his life to be predictable. But instead of it being predictable, people died under his command. He sees it as a deep and personal failure. Obviously, later in the game, there are periods throughout the story in which Dutch begins to manipulate people and blame others for the disorder and chaos that grows within the gang. But as far as the beginning of the game is concerned, I think it's clear that Dutch did not start out as a tyrant. He started out as a man with a plan. He was a man who accumulated many people over the years and would come to see them as his family. He established an immense reputation and was proud of his numerous accomplishments. He had finally reached a point in his life where he could plan one last score before retiring. I said at the beginning of this video that Dutch's goal was to gather enough money to buy land out in the West, but that goal evaporated once things became bad in Blackwater. It was the initial failure in Blackwater which caused Dutch to doubt himself and those around him. Every subsequent failure after Blackwater only furthered Dutch's descent into fear and doubt. This is why Dutch became so driven to rob Leviticus Cornwall's train. Let me explain. Dutch has a conversation with Jose and Arthur about robbing Leviticus Cornwall's train. Why are we doing this? The weather's breaking, we could leave. I, I thought we was lying low. Yeah, come on! What do you want from me, Jose? I just don't want any more folks to die, Dutch. I just want to stick to the plan, which was to lie low, then head back out west. Now, suddenly we're about to rob a train. What choice have we got? Dutch! Gentlemen, it is time to make something of ourselves. 
Get your horses ready. We have a train to rob. Hosea protests and reminds Dutch that they can leave. Unfortunately, Hosea's words are ignored. Dutch refuses to listen because he views this train robbery as an opportunity. The kind of opportunity that would not only allow him to regain faith in himself, but also, in Dutch's mind, a successful train robbery would restore the gang's faith in their leader. When I first saw Dutch behave this way and completely ignore Hosea, not only was I mad at him, I considered his actions to be reckless and selfish. Although my opinion hasn't really changed that much, when given the context of how Dutch was feeling about himself at this current part of the story, it becomes a lot clearer in understanding his motivation behind doing what he does and wanting to rob the train. He truly feels that everyone has lost faith in him, despite all of them sticking with him through it all. Not a single gang member abandons Dutch after things go badly in Blackwater, yet Dutch feels as though he is very close to losing everyone around him. Unfortunately for Dutch, he is a prideful man. He often hides his true feelings and motivations behind closed doors. This conversation between Dutch and Hosea is a great example. Both Dutch and Hosea know that they need money for the gang to survive. If Dutch told Hosea that he wanted to rob a train as a spectacle to regain a little lost respect, Hosea would think of his actions as selfish, but by focusing so much on their need for money, Dutch is spared from any harsh words from Hosea. Dutch isn't stupid after all. He's a very intelligent man, but often puts his own wants ahead of the groups. In Dutch's mind, I think one of his greatest fears is everyone leaving him, which is why he trusts Arthur and Hosea so much and John so little. Dutch values loyalty, despite himself not being a very loyal man. To him, loyalty is almost a requirement because it will guarantee obedience. You don't gotta worry about Javier's loyalty. I ain't so sure about any of you these days. And because he's a ruler archetype, it would frustrate him to no end if people endlessly argued with him and questioned his orders. That obedience is a requirement. This is why he later tells Arthur and Hosea to sit in the wagon furthest behind him when it comes time to leave. Arthur, you're in that one. Bring Hosea. I know you two like to talk about the good old days and what's gone wrong with old Dutch. It's almost as though he's putting Hosea and Arthur in timeout for questioning him. Dutch is not a very loyal man in many ways. One of the most subtle ways is through conversations throughout the game in which he flirts with Mary Beth despite being in a relationship with Molly. There is... There is something about you, Mary Beth. There really is. Thank you. Exactly as I planned. One of the more obvious ways he shows his lack of loyalty is by lying so often to the people closest to him. She was gonna betray us, Arthur. Couldn't you tell? Oh, well, I got some Spanish. She was. So how did you know she was gonna betray us? What'd she say? It was in her eyes, in the way she was leading us. But you said you knew Spanish. I know human beings. Arthur. Arthur and Hosea, despite being criminals, are always honest with one another and to Dutch. This is exactly why they often tell Dutch things that he doesn't want to hear. I don't mean that you have to be loyal to someone every time you tell someone the truth. That's not what I mean. I mean that if you're very good friends with someone to the point where you're essentially family and you have no problem with lying to them so you can get your way, that doesn't show loyalty, it shows callousness. Ultimately, this is exactly what allows Micah to infiltrate the group. Micah, being a manipulative man, tells Dutch everything he wants to hear and appeals to his ego. Oh, you're more than that, Dutch. You're, you're, well, you're amazing. Micah is more than willing to admit he is wrong when speaking with Dutch and is happy to listen to everything Dutch commands him to do. Because Arthur does not show this same eagerness to submit under Dutch's command, Dutch mistakes Arthur's honesty with disloyalty. This is a lesson I think the game developers display perfectly. 
You don't want friends in your life that will lie to you just to make you feel good. True friends will be honest with you even if it means that they disagree with you. Sadly, Dutch's pride is what allows him to listen to Micah's lies. Now let's talk about Dutch and John. Their relationship is very interesting and I think the most interesting dialogue between the two of them occurs in the camp, not in the cutscenes. We find out from a conversation between Arthur and Hosea that John left their gang for a year. So how are things with you and John? Fine. Ain't it about time you let it go now? It was a year, Hosea. He ditched us for a goddamn year. I've spoken to him many times. He knows he did wrong. Running off on that kid is one thing, but there's code. He knows that. Hey, Trelawney. Dutch and you pretty much raised him. Arthur is frustrated by this, and so is Dutch. They disapprove of John's actions, but for various reasons. Before John left the gang, Dutch considered both Arthur and John to be like sons. But I truly believe this changed once John left. I think Dutch grew to think of John as more of an adversary than a son. One of their conversations at the beginning of the game refers to John and his relationship with Jack and Abigail. I was talking to little Jackie. There's a fine boy you got. If he's mine, of course he's yours. It's the truest of gifts, a child. Yet you push him away. I ain't no kind of father. I wish the boy no harm, but well, you know how we live. We live free. If you say so. Dutch implies that John should focus on being a better father. Much later in the game, Dutch recognizes that John has become closer to his family and then proceeds to remind John that the gang comes first. Oh, it's nice to see you happy. Happy? Playing at family is beautiful. Why are you being strange with me? Just remember, the gang comes first. We fight for each other. That's all I'm saying. I Dutch does contradict himself, but I don't believe these statements contradict Dutch's character. I think both of these statements coming from him actually show exactly what we've been discussing in this topic about him being a ruler archetype. At the beginning of the game, he refers to John as an idiot. He is an idiot, Abigail. We all know it. Later, he tells John that he's arrogant. Don't you be an arrogant son of a bitch, John. You're better than that. And I don't believe either of those statements to be true. John left the gang because he didn't believe he was responsible for Abigail's son. To this day, there's still a lot of speculation as to whether Jack is actually John's son, but in any case, John didn't leave the gang because he thought he was too good for it or because he hated anyone. He left because the prospect of being a father terrified him. I believe Dutch viewed John's absence as betrayal and disloyalty. I don't believe he ever truly forgave John, and I don't believe he ever forgot either. Some things I can forgive, others I can forget. But I think this is completely in line with Dutch's archetype. As a ruler, it would make sense for him to view John's disappearance as a mark against his leadership abilities. Then you combine Dutch's archetype with his pride, and I think you have a recipe for disaster. I think his pride was severely wounded when one of his closest sons left him. I think he sincerely began to doubt his fatherly abilities. Instead of Dutch believing that John left because of the fear to become a father, Dutch believed that John left because he was a bad father. I think that's the kind of person Dutch is. I think everyone's decisions within the gang impact Dutch. If someone betrays Dutch, he feels as though it's his fault. If someone lies to him, he views it as his fault. If someone in the gang dies, he views it as his fault. I think he views every success and failure as a result of his leadership abilities. Under normal circumstances, that kind of internalization and acceptance of responsibility would be completely in line with his ruler archetype. But here's the catch. His pride continually gets in the way. 
When John left, his instinct was to assume personal responsibility for it, but his pride got in the way. It's all so complex, very complex, and the writers did a great job when they were writing Dutch, because it's not even Dutch's fault that John left, but because his archetype demands that he take responsibility for John's disappearance, he blames himself. But then when his pride steps in and doesn't allow him to take any responsibility for it, instead, his pride tells him that John left and it must be because John's stupid and not because Dutch is a bad leader. As the game progresses and Dutch slowly devolves from a ruler into a tyrant, that's when we begin to see a new side of Dutch which nobody has ever seen before. Earlier, I mentioned that I think Dutch views every success and failure as a result of his leadership abilities. But when Dutch begins to transform into a tyrant, Dutch begins to view every failure as a result of someone else's inadequacy, not his own. Oh, and here's the other one! I raised you as sons! Goddamn snakes! It's Arthur's fault, John's fault, Leviticus Cornwall's fault, the Pinkerton's fault, and eventually, Micah's fault. But not even Micah deserves the full blame of everything that transpired in the game. After all, everyone in the gang at one point agreed with everything Dutch was doing at one point. For years, everyone agreed with Dutch, followed his lead, and cheered him on. Dutch never forced anyone to follow him, and everyone went to Dutch for answers trusting him to make the right decisions. Let's fast forward to the last moments of Dutch at the end of Red Dead Redemption. Dutch, in this moment, recognizes that he can't change who he is. I think he views himself as a man doomed to a life of mistakes and tragedy because he can't stop fighting. He can't fight his own criminal nature just as he can't fight his pride in who he is. He can't fight the dreams he aspires to pursue and can't fight the inevitable fact that his life was doomed since he began a life of crime. It's very similar to Hosea actually in RDR2. Hosea states that they are doomed men. Don't take Dutch's patter about redemption too seriously. We're doomed, just like every other creature on this rock. But unlike them, we'll go down fighting. And the same statement is essentially portrayed in Dutch as well. I would like to believe that Dutch finally let go of his pride and regretted his past actions in his last moments, but nobody can be certain. So at the end of the day, what can we learn from Dutch? Arthur understood that it was his duty as a friend to Dutch to tell him exactly what he didn't want to hear. Arthur understood that in the end, loyalty was a good thing, but not the only thing that mattered. Sometimes, telling your leaders the truth will result in the destruction of everything you once knew. And sometimes telling the truth will result in better things taking place. I think our takeaway is that you should always try to tell the truth and not go along with the crowd just because the crowd seems to disagree. The bravest thing anyone can do is stand against the crowd. It's what Arthur did and I think it's something that we can all learn. Being a leader is no easy job and requires a great deal of responsibility. I think if we were to learn anything from this game, the most important lesson to take away from it is this. Beware of those who tell you everything you want to hear. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun making it. I really appreciate the support and if you guys could leave a like on this video and subscribe, it would mean the world to me. Hit the bell icon for notifications and leave a comment and let me know what you thought. That's it for me and I'll talk to you guys later.